Welcome to Total Picture Media and another edition of WTF 2020, an influencer's guide to navigating the shit show. My name is Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Here's mine. Between COVID-19, climate change, Black Lives Matter, a government in complete disarray with no leadership, no conscience, no integrity, no honesty, it feels like we're adrift in a sea of daily, oh my God, what happened now? For me, the media noise has become just too much. And after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, I had to just tune it out to stay somewhat sane. On most days, I write in my journal, avoid social media, avoid the news, stay focused on what you can control and contribute, and don't get lured in by shiny objects. So here's what the fuck 2020. I think the group of influencers, thought leaders, subject matter experts, innovators, and visionaries I've invited to participate in this series can give all of us some inspiration, a renewed sense of purpose, or at least some hope. I'm delighted to welcome back to Total Picture Media, Craig Fisher. Yeah, fish dogs. Craig is the founder of employer brand and recruitment tech process strategy firm, TalentNet Media. He's led global marketing, employer brand, and recruiting innovation at Allegis Global Solutions, North America's largest recruitment process outsourcing and staffing company. He's led talent acquisition teams at Fortune 500 level, owning recruitment process, marketing, and technology. His digital branding methods have been adopted as best practices by companies like LinkedIn, Toyota, Yum! Brands, Microsoft, and many more. He's the author of Inbound Recruiting and a popular keynote speaker at tech, social media, HR, recruiting, and sales conferences worldwide. And who the hell knows whenever we'll see those again, right? Uh, one of the questions I actually have for Craig. So, Craig, it's great to see you again, even if it's over Zoom. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. How are you doing? This is a, a, a wonderfully weird uh, situation we're in. Uh, I think that there have been so many problems with 2020, but uh, plenty of blessings as well. And, you know, I think this is going to be an interesting uh, conversation for us to have. I think so, too. So, well, let's start here. What's life in Dallas been like these days? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've been um, one of the states that has been partially open uh, for quite some time. We never really went back to full shutdown, um, but we got very close. Uh, our numbers in certain parts of the state are kind of high and other parts are very low. But we have to remember that Texas is the size bigger than Europe, let's say, right? So right. it's it's not all one thing, but North Texas, uh, my kids have been in school um, since uh, late August. Wow. And and that's, you know, rife with, uh, with problems. They get, you know, occasionally sent home for two weeks because someone in their class tested positive, um, you know, Personally, with my wife and I, we've been going out to restaurants uh, and, you know, socially distancing, sitting outside when we can um, and trying to get back to a tiny sense of normalcy. This last weekend, we just drove to uh, hang out with some friends in New Orleans where they bought a second home to get away from it all in the Garden District there. And honestly, it was nice to just be on the road for eight hours and not at our house. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of how we've been hanging out. How about you? Yeah, it's it, it's been really strange. I mean, I, you know, I go to Whole Foods, Costco and see my kids and, you know, I've been starting to go out to restaurants, uh, sit, sitting outside. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't gone back to my gym. Yeah, uh, that, you know, you have to wear a mask and I, I, I can't imagine no. ex exercising with the mask on. So, right. But 
you know, it, it seems like we're kind of, you know, there's certainly a lot more traffic on a 95. I live in, you know, Fairfield County in Connecticut and, um, people are out and about and doing things and having yard sales and yeah. pumpkin picking and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. I'm seeing the same thing. Plenty of traffic. Uh, you know, certainly I, I know from neighbors and, uh, friends that offices are certainly not back to 100% anywhere. And most offices are fairly vacant. Um, where people do have to be on site, you know, there's good protocols in place. Uh, but, you know, I'm fortunate to, I live at Grapevine Lake, so I've got outdoor places to exercise. And I've been a, a work from home guy for many, many years. So I've got a gym in my garage, and I'm very well prepared for all of this. And, uh, you know, I spend a whole lot of my time when I'm not on the road speaking at events or, uh, you know, on site with customers just like this. And so, you know, this is, I, I'm right in my element here. This is great for me and not having to get on planes is, is just an extra, yeah, you no know, kidding. wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I miss the events, but I sure don't miss the airports and the, the hassle of travel at all. Right. Well, you know, you know and interestingly, we, we had to pivot. Uh, so I, I run the talent net conference, uh, which is in uh, Texas right. and the Southwest. And it's the largest live event, in-person event, just for recruiting in the Southern United States and the longest running. We've been doing this. Uh, this is our 11th year hosting uh, an event in the fall in Dallas and in the spring on the first day of South by Southwest uh, in Austin and always at a major employer's headquarters. So uh, last year in Dallas, we were at Toyota's headquarters uh, this year, we were supposed to be at uh, VRBO uh, in Austin in the spring, and we had to push that back and create a virtual event. And so, you know, we've invested in the Hop-In platform, and we had a very successful first event in July for TalentNet uh, Austin. And because of that, a lot of other organizations started asking me to host and produce their virtual events because that Hop-In platform is expensive. It's a great experience. It's almost like being in person with your friends because of the amazing networking and uh, other things feature rich built into it. But we hosted the uh, ATAP, you know, the Association of Talent Acquisition mm -hmm. Professionals Global TA Day uh, in early September, which was a 14 hour event wow. covering all time zones, uh, 82 speakers. And so the logistics of getting all the speakers uh, tech tested beforehand and then running that event and speaking. I had to do three different presentations myself, but I also had to be at the helm from about 3 a.m. my time till 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m. my wow. time. And so I was uh, quite the zombie after that. Well, tell us a little bit more about the platform because I think, you know, so many companies and so many of us uh, that have been used to going to and, and producing live events are now going virtual and you know right. people are using zoom they're using um go to meeting and all kinds of different platforms so hop in and you can get there by going to hop in dot to hop in and it is really um the first time i saw it was the recruiting automation conference uh wade and wendy use this platform to uh, host their event. And it's just got a lot of really interesting and simple features. So on one side, so you've got a, a panel just like you and I are talking in, in the center, uh, or you can go to the reception area or you can go to an expo hall, uh, but it's all clickable just by uh, clicking a big button on, on one side of the panel. So you can be on the main stage or you can be in a session room or you can be at a vendor booth and it's just real simple. And the other cool thing is there's a networking function that you can uh, click into and it asks if you're ready with your camera and audio and you say, yes, okay, ready to go. And someone randomly in the queue pops into your little area and it's just you and them face to face for a quick three minute meeting. There's a countdown clock. So you know you have a certain amount of time to talk to each other and exchange information. And then it moves on and the next person in the queue pops in. It's a wonderful feature. It's, it's, it's very much like chat roulette and uh, it's uh, just, it's a lot of fun. And so the whole feeling of being able to 
walk into one session and then you know take the notes you want and then leave and walk into another session that's going on is very lifelike. It really feels like you're at a conference. And let's be honest, live events were starting to get live streamed everywhere already, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like even if we were in an office together or in an event together, we might very well be watching the other session on a phone or a, you know an iPad uh, or in an office together. We're doing this most of the time instead of actually meeting in a conference room because in big organizations, conference rooms are at a premium. They, they're hard to come by. So this is you know, already happening, I think. You, you had mentioned uh, your TalentNet Live Dallas 2020, um, which is November 20th. Tell us a little bit about this and how many people are going to be participating and who some of the uh, featured attractions, guests, speakers are going to be. Yeah, so this is going to be an interesting one. We'll have several hundred people participating in this. Last year at Toyota's Conference Center, uh, we had 350 people live. Uh, and, you know, that was, we, it would have been more, but, you know, due to the time, const uh, the uh, room constraints, that's what we had. But now that we're virtual and anyone can participate, uh, we'll have several hundred, which is great because we're also able to, we don't have any cost constraints, uh, invite people from all over the world to speak. So it'll be a little bit more of a global experience than just a regional one. And we've got uh, Vanessa Rath um, hosting an international panel uh, talking about diversity sourcing. She's from South Africa uh, to kick things off, which is really cool. Uh, and so, you know, those uh, enterprise organizations that have global teams and global organizations will be able to get a taste of what it's like to recruit in those odd regions where you don't necessarily have sourcing coverage. Uh, you don't necessarily have uh, an office or teams in place, or even if you do have an office, maybe you've only got 10 uh, employees and you know very little hiring, but they still are noisy and require attention. So we're going to get a little of that, which is really fun. Um, we're actually going to have a uh, HR famous session with the fistful of talent crew. So oh, we'll cool. have Chris Dunn and Tim Sackett and Jessica Lee and, and those folks actually hosting basically an HR famous podcast live on the air on video while we do it. We're going to have a recruiting animal show <laughs> while we're, while we're doing this, which is amazing. So he's going to have three different guests and his whole crew on to do a session during the event. Uh, and then we'll have the regulars from Dallas. It'll be me and Jim Schneider and uh, Jim Durbin and, you know, uh, a, a lot of the uh, faces that you see at TalentNet every year. Tin Cup, I'm sure, will be here. And, uh, you know, all of the wonderful, smart ladies that we have in the area. A lot of my uh, talent acquisition leader friends will be on as well, uh, hosting various panels and sessions. So it's going to be from 11 to 6, and that includes happy hour. We'll probably end up going to 6.30 uh, on that Friday, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So people can find out about that at talentnetlive.com. One of the um, disconnects I've seen in a lot of these virtual events is the, the happy hour, the cocktail hour, whatever you want to call it. But it sounds like this hop in is a little bit different in the way you're able to manage things like, uh, you know, like a happy hour. So, so give us an idea of, of what that looks like. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty interesting in a, in a session room, for instance, I could create a virtual water cooler or a virtual happy hour room and up to 20 people can be on screen sharing their audio and video at the same time with it. And up to a thousand people can view it. So when, you know, when people need a break, they can turn their camera off and someone else can pop in. And so from that uh, perspective, it's a little bit zoom like, but it's just easier to navigate. And from what I've seen, there are generally fewer technical problems with people uh, not able to connect and not able to share their audio and things like that. So uh, I think it's going to be, well, what we've seen in the events that I've done uh, is it's a really fun um, feature rich environment to take place in. And people really enjoy, 
you know, grabbing their drink at the end of a Friday after after a long day and uh, and having a toast. So we're actually hosting another one on Thursday for Visage.jobs. Uh -huh. uh, this is a platform where you can crowdsource sourcing. They actually sponsor my podcast, uh, Inside Talent at InsideTalent.org. And they are hosting a global sourcing festival uh, on Thursday morning of this week. So there's another opportunity. It's free. You can see about that at visage.jobs. Uh, so join us there if you want a sneak peek at what the hop-in platform looks like. It should be really fun. One of the one of the advantages in producing virtual conferences, you, you can book a whole bunch of presenters from all over the world and not have to worry about paying for the airfare, the hotels, the food. Uh, it's uh, it, it's a, a really unique advantage. And this is something, Craig, that I think everyone is going to get familiar with and get better at. Yes. So I'm wondering what the hell is going to happen to conferences, live conferences, especially mm -hmm. the scale of, uh, you know, HR Tech or uh, mm -hmm. uh, Unleash or Sherm Annual with 25,000 people. Are we ever going to see anything like that again? Yeah, so those things are in the most danger in the short term, right? I mean, certainly there's um, millions of dollars in revenue at stake across these organizations. And, you know, you think about a CES, for instance, right? The Consumer, Consumer Electronics Show. That's, that's, a, that's a multi, that's like a billion dollar industry, right? That just, just that's hosting right. those events, something crazy like that. Um, and so I don't see us getting together like that in 2021. I, I really don't. I think that what we're going to be dealing with, um, with, you know, COVID coronavirus uh, is, a year long more of, you know, very high caution. Uh, at some point we'll all have gotten it or it'll be uh, diluted enough that it's not such a, a viral threat all the time. But, uh, you know, until we have working regular vaccines and rapid tests that are approved by the FDA, there's gonna be a very tricky, you know, uh, scenario to try to get thousands of people in a room. I think we'll see more regional conferences where we can space out a few hundred people in a room. Right. And I think that's going to be the trend because there's no way we can go to an expo hall. If you think about even going to the farmer's market right now, you bump into too many people. Uh, and, you know, it's just, it's like employers who intend to bring everyone back into their offices. They're going to have a hard time hiring and competing for talent because we are now you know, even if there were no COVID after this, we'd all still be really, really sketchy about going in and sitting in a bullpen full of coworkers where everyone's touching the same things and there's no mask, there's no partitions. Uh, it would be, uh, for a lot of people, a really dicey proposition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all you have to do is, is look at movie theaters. Right. And the challenge is, you know, uh, Hollywood is having trying to get people to come back into movie theaters, even with, you know, 50 percent reduced audience. People just aren't willing to take that risk. Yes. And so I think that there's a real unique opportunity there. And you can you can tell by my background here. I'm a media buff. Right. I mean, this is this is my thing. And so I'm big, uh, you know, into what's going to happen with movie theaters. And I think they become sort of conference venues, or you can actually rent out an Alamo draft house for a private screening of things uh, right now. And so there are ways to utilize these spaces that aren't the traditional model. And I think because of streaming technology and because of the low cost of a, you know, a large flat screen TV, we change that model to where we're having movie parties you know, at people's homes and you do pay uh, kind of a premium to do it. And there are already apps coming out on Disney Plus and, and other uh, popular streaming services to have a movie party and share what you're watching with other people. And so I think in an industry that was already starting to have issues because of streaming, right? We saw the music industry, uh, CD sales tank and, and things like that, and then start to come back up because of streaming services sharing revenue. I think we're going to see the same thing uh, in the movie industry for sure. You brought up that, that you think there, there'll probably be more regional conferences and smaller conferences. When I when I talked to William Tincup about this very topic, uh, 
he seems to think, and I, I, I agree with William on this, that there, that organizations are going to start having more of their own corporate specific events. So you, right. you've got a company, you invite 50 people who are mm -hmm. the right 50 people to have in the room, and then it's really worth it for you to bring in your prospects and your clients for a one day user conference. Um, do you think that is going to become more of a trend as well? It is. So over the last uh, few years of my tenure with Allegis, uh, and I left there, I accepted a package and a big layoff in May, along with 400 of my coworkers. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but I was responsible for creating the customer conference uh, that we had there. And it was exactly that. It was pay for a handful of customers and potentially prospects to come in and see presentations from, you know, your top tech vendors and uh, some thought leaders and key strategists to, you know, understand the market and have a good time, right? There's the whining and dining and all those other things that go along with it. And I do see that as a trend, uh, you know, the, the user conference. So this visage.jobs event is basically a user conference as well. They're doing it virtually, but I think their intention is to eventually host you know, in remote locations, which I think is is great. And that's probably what is going to happen. There will be a lot more of that. There's a good reason for it. So my strategy, even at HR Tech for Allegis, was don't spend $30,000 on a booth, right? Even a small right. booth. Um, yeah, you who know, needs to be in the vendor ghetto? You know? That's right. Host your own party and uh, and take people to dinner afterwards. And that works way better. Yeah. Um, you know, no offense to the people at the HR tech conference. Uh, but I think companies are way more likely to, even with these virtual events, start their own spinoff events around the bigger conferences. And uh, we're going to see more of that. And people are going to be incentivized to attend uh, with, you know, luxurious packages of things to interact with the conference uh, being delivered to your home. And, you know, uh, personalized wine gifts and things like that saying, hey, join us and show off what we sent you, that sort of thing. There's, there's all kinds of marketing tricks to make this happen. And I think that's what we're going to see in the short term. And in the long term, yeah, there's yeah, I, those I, user I conferences. Think, I think so too. And, and like, yeah. you know, what you used to do with TalentNet where you were going into like one of your clients' offices, like a Toyota or whatever, um, I think you're going to see a lot more of those kinds of things. I, I've produced a lot of events in, in that vein for uh, like Future Workplace, where mm -hmm. they have a member conference and, and the member conference is at, you know, Infor, one of their member right. clients, and they have beautiful facilities and they invite all of these people in there and they're, and they're really great events and they're and they're really terrific from a networking standpoint because all of your peers are there yeah um, it's the cxr model yeah right, and, right. Uh, exactly. and, and we're all mimicking that in some way or shape or other yeah so so what are your clients telling you about 2021 as far as marketing and advertising how are they going you know there's probably not going to be any south by southwest or any and when you look at the all of the apps out there now and all of the tech solutions that everybody has come out with. And now, of course, since COVID, there's a lot of consolidation going on, mm -hmm. right? Yep. In the industry. And you better be able to come in there and go, here's the problem I'm solving. Boom. Right. Three minutes. Yeah. Because, you know, most of the videos, you know, marketing and sales videos that I make are just that they're three minutes long because you're yes, not going to get people to sit there for a half an hour or 45 minutes watching a product demo. Right. Even when I do something like this and you and I know this, this is what we do, right? We're going to cut it up into 30 second or three minute sound bites of video to tease and go listen to the rest of it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What has sort of inspired you in, in this whole evolution that we're going through right now in, in with with covid and and the way the world has been completely turned upside down from right you know wh when i talked to john sumser he said well you know you can throw machine learning out the window because everything the machines have been learning is no longer relevant <laughs> you know 
I am going to disagree with that a little bit. Okay. Um, because Good. so I started implementing um, AI processes or machine learning processes, because we know it's not super really intelligent, um, but machine learning processes into uh, application and career onboarding and um, uh, you know recruitment uh, candidate experience processes a long time ago, three and four years ago is when we started. So my organization, my consulting team at Allegis started implementing uh, you know, Olivia and some of these other chatbots into uh, employers' processes quite a while ago. And at first they weren't very good and they weren't very smart because what employers started doing is the same thing they do with a lot of software implementations, which is strip out the services layer. They think they're getting cheated uh, by that, right? It's the SAP model. We'll give you our free software, but then we're going to charge you a million dollars a year for the services. And so their, their gut reaction is to strip that out. The reality is with machine learning, you have to pay people to build those questions and answers into the products in order to understand. So even if you're just texting with a candidate um, and building in a communication layer that helps the candidate experience be better because frankly, recruiting teams aren't good at that. <clears throat> um, what we have now, three and four years later, are actually pretty smart devices and, and applications that are able to do some really good things. And we've got really good data to understand how those products can actually work better. So I don't think that necessarily much has changed because it's still automating non-recruiting activities. And that's what we're trying to do. Get non-recruiting activities out of recruiters' hands and let recruiters build relationships like they should be doing. And so the other things, the, the sourcing and the stack ranking and the scheduling and the assessments and all those things that can be automated are still really in good shape. I don't think there's, there's anything wrong with that. So one of the things that, so I do a lot of work in the RPO space. And so I see a lot of what those uh, companies, Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 and Fortune 50 customers are asking for. And a whole lot of it is, you know, staffing prices are going down. It's a forced market thing. Uh, and so teams are shrinking. And so how do we do more with automation? And that is the number one thing we're getting asked for. Uh, and so sourcing for, um, you know, mass hiring, volume hiring uh, is a big deal a lot of that's going to be automated. Um, you know, doing these non-recruitment activities, uh, that kind of AI automation uh, is, is really important. And so I'm inspired by that kind of consolidation. I think we can do more with fewer people, but it doesn't mean that that workforce is drastically going to shrink. They're just going to be tasked to more important things, if you ask me. I think that recruiting position gets elevated by the addition of automation. Well, given your unique perspective, you know, working with RPOs and staffing agencies, when will people return to their offices? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of my customers is a company called Cisco Meraki, and they are um, a, a company that was acquired about four years ago by Cisco. Uh, and this is Cisco Systems, not Cisco Foods, right? The, the networking technology organization, Cisco. And they're one of the few uh, acquisitions to not just become Cisco, right? They get mm -hmm. to keep their own identity because they're very unique in the marketplace and they're very important for Cisco's product line. And so I'm helping them with an employer value proposition to kind of keep their identity or distinguish their identity yet still be part of Cisco. How do you go to market and attract the right tech people uh, in order to do that. So what I've heard from them is, as well as Toyota and some of my other customers, uh, is that, yeah, we're not going to be back in the office until sometime mid-2021. And even then, it's going to be optional or every other day or, you know, things like that, it, you know, in shifts. But mostly, it's going to be the option. And I think the forward-thinking companies are, are doing it right if that's what they're doing. Because, you know, let's face it, there is a, a, a percentage of the U.S. population that doesn't feel a threat by COVID. They're like, fine, I don't even need a mask. 
which you know is a little crazy. Exactly. Uh, and then but there's a whole lot of people that are really scared to death of this and want to do the right thing and want to help you know protect uh, you know your your network and your friends and your family. So um, I, I think I've seen a couple of companies that are kind of hardcore saying we're coming back and you know, that, that will be okay for a, a certain percentage of the population, but not for everyone, certainly. And I think one of the surprises from this whole fiasco that we've been living through for the last eight months is the fact that companies are realizing that people who are working from home are more productive, they're happier, mm -hmm. they get a lot more done, they feel less stressed, Mm -hmm. because they are working from home and they're able to, you know, take care of their families as well as do their jobs. And it's been a boon, especially for like uh, people with disabilities. That's right. Because now they can really shine and, and use their skills to the optimum of their abilities instead of worrying about how the hell they were going to get into a building, right. you know? Yeah. And that's something that makes me really happy. The other thing that you can count on now is people in tech hubs have been bugging out and going to move to the center of the country, to Idaho and to the Midwest and, you know, remote Key West, whatever. Um, they are because they have the option, right? I mean, if you can work remotely, you can do anything and you don't have to be in a room full of developers in order to get your, get your work done because you're going to be exchanging code on GitHub and on Slack and uh, Discord. And th there's no reason that uh, you have to be in a basement full of machines. So all of our services are primarily in the cloud now, even if they're on premise, right? You've got your own designated uh, servers. And so I don't, I don't see any you know, direct need for that. And so employers are now starting to and that we saw this trend start five years ago when big tech employers in, uh, you know, the San Francisco area started buying up remote offices in Austin and Chicago and places like that, and and really starting to distribute where the hubs where they recruit from. And if you can recruit people from anywhere and say, yeah, these are A players, because how many A players got released in the spring uh, and and right. since then, and a bunch of B players. And you have to have both things in order to have a functioning office. So some of the top people on the market got other things going on, gig economy work and consulting work, and they're happy as a clam. You can't say, oh, you need my job. We're definitely coming to this office. You have to be able to say, you know what, you can work from anywhere and uh, we want you. And, and that's, I think that's how we move forward. One of the trends that I've certainly seen over the past four to six months is a lot of really good recruiters have been laid off mm -hmm. and are now moving towards a contract mm -hmm. versus FTE. Yep. And it, it seems that that is a trend that is going to continue. They're, they're going to be more like the sourcing model than the traditional recruiting or talent acquisition model that we have come to know and love for the past, you know, 20 years. years. Let's say 10. You agree? Yeah. And, and I'll tell you why I agree exactly with that, because we're in a situation now, Peter, which, you know, we see every 10 or 12 years, right? Economy dips, unemployment goes up. We'll start to see some, um, you know, signs of bigger recession and inflation. Uh, at some point, there'll be a lag effect. This is not a short-term thing. This is a three-year thing. Um, and when that happens, very often, full-time employment goes down and contract employment goes up. Staffing firms know this. We see it right. all the time, right? We see a lot of these cycles. And so that's what we're seeing now. And because you and I see it in the recruiting space more than anything else, we're seeing you know, kind of the net effect of that. Uh, because of that, um, Enterprise organizations have to be able to flex, right? That's why RPOs are popular. But right now, the flex is down. So RPOs are laying people off left and right. Uh, and so, you know, we'll see it come back in certain sectors where you have volume hiring, uh, retail, uh, call centers, things like that. Um, but the, you know, that's a, that's a 
25% or less percent of the market. Um, and it's a cheap uh, sort of uh, way to hire uh, and, and, you know, staffing firms don't profit a huge amount from that. It's something you, you have to have in order to service certain, certain customer bases, but it's not the bread and butter of most staffing organizations. So uh, yeah, this is, this is the net effect of an economic change and COVID just accelerated that economic change. It was already coming, right? I mean, we've seen signs of that for, for quite a while. Lots of construction, very low interest rates, uh, you know, always precipitate uh, this sort of economic uh, impact. Yeah, I want to I want to return to AI and machine learning for a second because, as you know, Craig, over the last five or six years, a lot of these tech companies have been promising that their solution will take bias out of recruiting. Uh -huh. Do you think we're getting to the point with AI and machine learning that they're truly able to take the the bias that we've all seen? for many years out of the recruiting process? We're getting there, yes. It's not perfect, certainly. And um, it's gonna take a couple of years worth of use and massaging and data to uh, prove that it works, right? So the bottom line for any of this um, proof point is, did the organization get better, right? Were they more productive and efficient and did they do better as a company? And so I don't think the, the end to this scenario is, yes, we got more diverse. Did it have a positive business outcome? Because more diverse for some companies looks different than more diverse for others. Um, and the goal is to have diversity of thought and inclusion and be a better employer. And in general, that makes for more profitable co companies, right? And so that's what we really want to see. So just having diversity in a bubble uh, isn't the ultimate outcome. It's a good outcome. It's a good place to move towards, but it has to mean better business outcomes. So we don't know how well this um, process is working yet. Uh, there is starting to be blinding of resumes, which I think is very interesting. So you strip out um, a candidate's name, you strip out any uh, he, she, you know, type of things that will indicate, um, you know, a lot of these things that we want to not be biased about. You strip out any salary information. We're even stripping out the names of colleges and just putting top 250 school, things like that. There are a couple of companies that are able to do this on a templated scenario mm -hmm. that is very specific to each organization's desires and needs. Um, and so if you can do that, and if over time it starts to affect hiring manager behavior, uh, then that could lead to the outcome we desire. The problem with all this is right now, hiring managers, for the most part, they get a rec. And before they even put that rec into the system, they go off and do their own LinkedIn search to see who they know that could do that job, who's available, what do they look like? that kind of informs how they're gonna put the job in the system. And that's a biased scenario right there. So yes, AI and uh, machine learning can fix a few of the biases of applicants and possibly even sourced candidates. But in most organizations, applicants aren't the people who get the job a lot of the time. Um, it's referrals, right? right? It's still the biggest, and that, very often comes from the hiring manager or someone the hiring manager knows. So there's an inherent bias there that we have to fix as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I, I've certainly heard horror stories of recruiters saying, well, you know, my hiring manager went to the University of Michigan and he wants to hire people from the University of Michigan. That's just yeah, and, thing, and they're, you know? they're blatant about it. And yeah. <laughs> that, that has to get fixed. Yeah. What piece of advice would you give to an organization or a company that says, hey, we need to have a virtual conference because we can't do this thing live this year, but we really need to get our message out there. What two or three important things should they consider if they're planning on doing a virtual event? Right. So first and foremost, um, don't be generic, right? If you use Zoom, 
hire someone who really knows what they're doing with Zoom and create a really good experience. Build in a lot of networking. Uh, understand that there's, you know, if you just are all business the entire time and there's no fun, um, that, you know, people are going to get bored. And, uh, you know, the average attention span for a virtual event is about four hours uh, tops and people just get fatigued. So figure out ways to get them unfatigued, have a yoga room that they can go stretch in, right? Virtually anyway. Um, but think about other platforms. Hop in is a really good one. The, there are uh, several others you can choose from as well that give kind of a more immersive experience. Hire a producer that knows what they're doing, right? That's going to be yeah. kind of an important thing. And if you get somebody from outside your organization, but get them immersed enough in what you do, um, they can bring a fresh perspective because they've seen it at a lot of other events. Um, and then finally, make it interesting and entertaining and fun and feel like a fancy white glove thing for the people you're inviting. Send them some physical things to attach them to the virtual event uh, by mail. There are all kinds of great uh, apps that you can do that with now. And, you know, you're not spending uh, $20,000 on a venue, right? That's right. And don't think of that as pocketing the money. Um, spend some of that money to make the event really special. Craig, I really appreciate your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, just one last thing. What, what would you like to leave our audience with? What, what um, uh, have you gleaned over the past eight or nine months that you think is important to share? So we're all employees of either ourselves, our own, you know, gigs, or some employer, right? Even if you're unemployed right now, you should be starting your own LLC and researching the companies that you want to work for and publishing that as work, right? The research that you do. And so we're all working, you know, for someone, even if it's ourselves or prospective customers. So take this virtual thing that we have seriously, um, absorb the freedom that we have and give yourself a break. But when you're doing this, don't slouch, don't get on with your camera off. Take it seriously. This is work. Every interaction you have is an extension of who you are. And this is how it is right now. So invest in some good lights and a decent camera and a great place to set up and distraction free so that you can look at the camera and people feel like you're engaging with them. Uh, and if you want any help with that, uh, just go look at my LinkedIn profile, look at some of my videos or give me a call. I'm glad to help. Awesome. And so what's the best way for people to connect with you, Craig? Yeah, you can find me at uh, talentnetlive.com. My email address is craig at talentnetlive.com. Um, I'm also at fishdogs on Twitter and Instagram and fishdogs.com is my personal bio. And uh, I'm real easy to find. Connect yeah. with me on LinkedIn for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll definitely be the first Craig Fisher that comes up on just about any search that you do. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, I, re I really appreciate your time today.